All right, here we go. Welcome to chapter 26. This will be the last chapter we cover before test one. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Chapter 26 starts off with talking about systematics. Well, to know what systematics is, we have to know what taxonomy is. So as you might already know, taxonomy is the science of the naming and classifying organisms. So taxonomy involves the naming and classifying organisms. Now, you might be familiar with this system. You might have learned in grade school. There's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. All right, so these are different taxa, all right, or different classification groups, different taxa, going from largest to smallest. And maybe in grade school or high school, your teacher came up with a mnemonic to help you remember the order of these. Something about King Philip, blah, blah, blah. I could never remember King Philip one. You do need to memorize the order of them from largest to smallest. Now, my favorite one was always kings play chess on fat girl stomachs. Okay, it's a little weird, but it's easy for me to remember. Now, what's off the view of this screen, but you can see in your textbook, there's actually a taxon that's bigger than kingdom, which is the domain. So now I just modify it for it to dumb kings play chess on fat girl stomachs. All right, so we also need to know what phylogeny is. You don't, don't write this down. All you have to know is that ph phylogeny denotes the evolutionary relationship or evolutionary history between organisms. In other words, think of phylogeny as the tree of life. Now, when you put them both together, you get systematics. In other words, what is systematics? It is classifying organism based on their evolutionary history. So that is what modern classification, that's what we try to do. We try to classify organisms based on their evolutionary history. All right, and the relationships with each other. And how do we figure this out? Well, we look at the fossil record. We look at biochemical evidence, such as proteins. Um, if you do the extra credit for cytochrome C, cytochrome C is a very important protein. You might remember from Bio 151 that we have these things called mitochondria that are really, really important. And we have these things on the inner membrane called the electron transport chains. And one of these important enzymes is cytochrome C and because it's really, really important. All eukaryotes have cytochrome C. But the gold standard to figure out evolutionary relationships is DNA, it's the genetic evidence. All right, let's talk a little bit about classical taxonomy. And I think what I want to do is switch if I can find it. Maybe I can't find it. Yeah, I can. My ink color. Let's see if this works. All right. So um, what did Carlos Linnaeus give us? He gave us our scientific names of organism, a system called binomial nomenclature. And Carlos Linnaeus loved Latin. He even lat Latinized his name. So you may remember that. The scientific name for humans is Homo sapien, right? Homo is the genus name and sapiens is the species name. And it should be written in italics, but I can't do that. So if you can't write in um, italics, it has to be underlined, Homo sapien. And often it's just represented, the genus is just often a capital letter um, with a period and then the species name is always spelled out. So we can either call ourselves Homo sapiens or H sapiens. And again, the whole thing either has to be italicized or underlined. And again, the way I wrote this, it shows you the genus name has to be capitalized. The species name is never capitalized. So your next test or quiz, and for the rest of your scientific career, you should know how to write a scientific name. Another example, we looked at fruit flies in Bio 151. They were Drosophila melanogaster. Okay, Drosophila is the genus name and melanogaster. I can write this out with this pen, is the species name, and the whole thing would either have to be italicized or underlined. So Carl Linnaeus, he came up with this system of scientific naming that we still use today. We have to give him credit for it. Now, another thing he came up, he came up with the whole system of kingdom phylum class order. All right, he came up with this idea of nested taxa. So if we go back up to that very first slide, all right, you can see that there are several species, all right, in one genus. And there are many genera in one family, all right? And there's lots of families in the order. And he just looked at life and he noticed this pattern, all right? Now, here's an irony. 
he was a contemporary of Charles Darwin, and he did not believe in evolution at all. But ironically, this Nesta tax system <laughs> is perfectly predicted by evolution. So we will illustrate this. All right, so according to Darwin, you have organisms evolving along together, and then you have some kind of speciation event, right? And we talked about that. It could be allopatric speciation, sympatric speciation. It could be, you know, originally uh, triggered by a Great Canyon divide or a mountain range, and then you have reproduct some kind of reproductive isolation. All right, so there's all these different speciation events, right? As you go farther and farther back in time. All right, I'm not the best artist. All right, so this is Charles Darwin's view of the tree of life. And look at this, these two would be closely related species in the same genus. And these would be, let's say, species or genus genera in the same family. All right, and then maybe all of these, all right, would be in the same order. So if you take Darwin's view of evolution, it would create these nested taxa that Carlos Linnaeus observed in nature, even though ironically he was staunchly opposed to the idea of evolution. So again, he observed these next nested taxa in nature. All right, so again, and believe it or not, he did an amazingly good job of, of classifying organisms, and even though he didn't do it based on evolutionary relationships, he's his work basically illustrates most of um, evolutionary relationships. So how did he and taxonomists since this time um, decide taxa? All right, well, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to say this thing, that um, this assumes organisms are in the same taxa are more closely related. So that if two species are in the same genus, like there used to be Homo sapien and Homo erectus and Homo neanderthal, we would be all in the same genus, all right? And again, there's different species of Drosophila, all right? But um, they're all in the same genus. All right, so if you're in the same genus or same genera, you'd be somewhat closely related to. If you're same family, you know, you're more distantly related. All right, so how do taxonomists decide taxa? It's characteristics of the taxonomist choice. And again, for not really knowing anything about evolution, Lin Linnaeus and taxonomists since him have done an amazing job at fig uh, focusing on the right characteristics. For example, homology. You are familiar with the idea of bone homology. We know why the human, the cat, the whale, and the bat all have a humerus in their forelimb, all right? And it's not just called the same name. In every single one, there's a rounded, one rounded end and a funny little groove at the other end. And we have the same pattern of one bone and then two bones and then multiple bones, the humerus, the radia, the ulna, the metacarpals, and the phalanges, all right? We know we all have humeruses because all these animals, human, cat, whale, bat, have genes for humerus and radius and ulna. And so if we have the same genes, all right, for a humerus, um, we assume we got this from a common ancestor, even though our lines eventually diverged. All right, so homology is a good indicator of, of recent evolutionary past. Human, cats, whales, and bats were all vertebrate animals, and we're mostly more closely to related to each other than something like a jellyfish, which is an animal that doesn't have bones. But here's the caveat. Do you guys know what caveat means? I'll tell you, caveat means warning or caution. Here's the caveat. Similar shape morphology does not always represent a recent common ancestry. I mean, again, we're all related by evolution, all organisms, but some of us are more closely related than the other. So why don't you pause this bi um, video for a second and talk to a bio buddy and see if you can think of any examples of two animals having similar structures that are not closely related by evolution. Okay, do you think of any? All right, how about the streamlined shape of a dolphin and shark? We saw that in our whale videos. Dolphins and shark, their body forms, their morphology looks very similar, but a dolphin is a mammal and a shark is a fish, even though of course they're related by evolution, they're not very close relatives. Another example is the eye of a human and the eye of an octopus. We both have complex eyes, all right, but 
we are not closely related by evolution. I mean, the octopus doesn't even have bones, okay? Um, and here's one of my favorite examples here. The marsupial Australian mole and the placental North American mole. All right, both these moles look very similar to each other because they adapt, are adapted over millions of years to similar environments, all right? They both dig in the ground. They both have common lifestyles. So they have the same type of natural selection pressures and they look very, very similar. But here's the deal. You, as a placental mammal, are more closely related to the North American mole than these two moles are related to each other. Isn't that crazy? You, as a placental mammal, are more closely related to the mole at the bottom than these two moles are related to each other. So again, even though they have similar shapes, they're not that closely related by evolution. All right, in fact, what you just saw here, these two moles, this is an example of what we call convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is means similar selection pressures have produced similar morphologies in distantly related organisms. So this is something you should know. You don't have to memorize this definition word for word, but you should get the general idea. We see examples of convergent evolution when we have a situation where similar selection pressures, similar natural selection events, result in similar morphology in distantly related organisms. Okay? So again, if you go back to the streamlined shape of the dolphin and the shark, uh, these are two animals that are not closely related to each other because one's a mammal and one's a fish, but they have similar shapes because of similar selection pressures. And so that's one reason that um, we look at DNA evidence a lot to try to come up with our ultimate classification events. All right, um, by the way, a synonym to convergent evolution is analogy. This is a word your text uses. So he would, your, he, your, your text authors would say the streamlined shape of the dolphin and the shark are analogous to each other. In other words, they have the same function in the same environment. I prefer to use the word convergent evolution, um, but you should be aware of the other one. All right, so this unit is sort of tying together the first four chapters that we talked about in this course, constructing the phylogenetic tree. Again, big word, I just think of it as the tree of life. So whenever you see one of these tree of lives, I want you to realize it's a hypothesis. It's a visual eye hypothesis that communicates our understanding of the evolutionary relationships of these organisms. All right, so again, whenever you see these phylogenetic trees, remember they are simply a hypothesis. I mean, a hypothesis backed up with evidence though, but here's the deal. All right, if we get more evidence, more data, we might modify these branches. All right, and, and quite frankly, it happens all the time. All right, so how do we construct these phylogenetic trees? So this is something cool that your book does. We'll find that cladistics is a useful tool in constructing phylogeny. Now, in order to use cladistics, we have to um, know what a clade is. So this is a very important definition, and you probably should memorize this verbatim for your test. So clade is a grouping that includes an ancestral species and all of its descendants. All right, it's a grouping that includes an ancestral species and all of its descendants. And it's very important to know. And we will end this little video by playing a little game. All right, are you ready to play the game clade or not clade? It's lots of fun. All right, here we go. Here's the first challenge. Is this grouping, what you see in orange, is this a clade or not a clade? All right, hopefully you guys said not a clade because even though this grouping includes the ancestral species, all right, it does not show all of the descendants. It leaves out humans. So this is not a clade, okay? So now we're gonna play again. Hopefully you understand that. So um, if you're with more than one peep, person. Let's divide up into groups of three and you can each pick one of these three examples and play the game clade or not a clade. All right, are you ready? Let's play clade or not a clade. All 
Are you ready? All right, the first grouping, this is a clade. All right, maybe I need to change my pen color again. All right, this first grouping is a clade because it shows the ancestral species and all of the descendants. So this is a clade. This is what we're after in modern taxonomy and systematics. We try to make our taxons clades. And another important thing you should know, a clade is synonymous with a monophyletic group. I think mono means one, one clade. All right, let's go look at grouping number two. Did you say clade or not a clade? Hopefully you said not a clade, because even though it shows the includes the ancestral species in some of the descendants, it leaves this these descendants out. They leave these out alongside. So para means alongside, just like a paramedic works alongside a, a, a medic. This is a paraphyletic grouping because some members of the clade are left out alongside. And finally, grouping number three, this is called a polyphyletic grouping. Hopefully you also recognize this is not a clade because even though this does include the ancestral species and all of the descendants, it includes some extra. So um, this is a polyphyletic grouping, all right, because it includes more than one clade, all right? So these are terms you don't have to memorize verbatim, but you should understand them. And so I want to conclude by saying thank you for playing clade or not clade, and I'll see you next time. Bye.